Yes! Come on up, Brian. You are our first guest. Uh, we've got some early birds. I'm going to sit here. All the phones are up. If you guys can't see us, feel free to readjust. That's all good. Brian, welcome. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And it's a lovely place again. We, we love it here. We, we came in Thursday night, so... Yeah, we... Gent, really Gent's like beautiful. It. Genuinely, Belgium. I think Ghent is my favourite city now. Uh, you know the, the big... I can't think what's called. The big clock in the middle, I'll call it. They, they were chiming to uh, the Circle of Life of the Lion King yesterday. Right. I found that so amazing. I, I might live here. So, uh, you've been to Ghent before? No, it's our first time. We've been to Belgium uh, three times, but um, first time again, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's gen generally, you, you, you're nailing it, Ghent. So, um, thank you for being our first guest, Brian. Uh, we, we've covered Ghent, so uh, any, if you've got any recommendations for Brian, when we do the Q&A part, please throw them our way. Um, it's May the 4th, uh, now traditionally Star Wars Day. Yeah, yeah it sure is. Uh, yeah. Every year we, we get invited somewhere or other, and it is, yeah, it's great to do. I was going to say, because that's, May the 4th has only been a thing for about five years now. Are you find in that you get, get a lot of that where people are like, Star Wars, tell us everything Star Wars, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as I say, we, last year we were in Switzerland, and they invited us back this year, but Gen got in first, so... So I'm not disappointed, it's, it's lovely. Yeah, so you, you're lucky again. Switzerland nearly stole him from you. Um, but Brian, for like I, we've chatted before, and you know I'm a big fan of everything you do. But uh, for any of you who don't know, Brian has worked on... His CV is so incredible. You've worked on some of the best films that ever made, and you've made some of the most iconic things in the world. Yeah, I'm... Um, in 48 years, I actually started way back in 1968 at Elstree Studios, which was at that time Associated British Productions. Yeah. And we were do, uh, doing all small films, and I was lucky enough to be the only apprentice sculptor ever in the film industry in England. Really? Yeah, so I had a great training. And uh, funny enough, when I finished my apprenticeship at the age of 20, the British film industry was in decline. So yeah. I was, on the day I come out of my apprenticeship, I was made redundant. I thought, well that's it, my career is finished before I start. Longest career ever. But I was lucky enough to get a, um, a job outside of a company in London who had been going for a hundred years and they did prestigious work all over London. So at the age of 20, I had work unveiled by the Queen of England. At 22, I had work unveiled by uh, the Queen Mother. And I did pre prestigious work all over London until I was only 23 when I got a call from the old guy I trained under and he said, there's a film starting at Elstree, would you like to be involved with it? So, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, I'd love to come back to the film industry and it was Star Wars. Star Wars, first uh, film job. Uh, no, not a big one then, not a big one. Well, the first film job back into the film industry. Yeah, um, you know I mean, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, I think it's great, a great film to start on. I mean, when, no one knew at the time just how big a film it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and the crew were very pessimistic. We all thought it was gonna be a load of rubbish. Until we were proven wrong the following year when we went to the crew showing up in London. And, um, then you see that great big spaceship come over overhead, oh, and everyone, destroy, yeah. yeah, everyone applauded, and that, and then at the end of the film, it actually got a standing ovation from this same pessimistic crew. <laughs> so yeah, but the actual film itself, I I did the um, stormtrooper armor, yeah, uh, Darth Vader, yeah, um, so nothing iconic. <laughs> no, the other characters weren't quite so iconic. I, they did all the finishing work on uh, C-3PO, the Death Star droid I did, oh, and, wow. and uh, CZ-3, which is a strange character. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That was in the same crawler. Yeah, uh, and also uh, very hard to find the toy of that, I believe. Um, CZ-3, you can get them, but they're quite rare. Yeah, they're rare, aren't they? Yeah, um, the Death Star droid, you get more of them about. And they're very keen on the Death Star droid in Germany for some reason. Oh, really? Yeah. 
It's weird though, isn't it, how uh, everyone has their own little, little favourite? Yeah, you can't yeah. Tell I mean, there's no doubt about it, Vader is the character. I mean, he's he's one of the, the, the more well-known ones, I'd say, in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. I mean, it must be must be quite crazy what it's... When was, when was Star Wars now? 76? 76. Yeah. I started on it in January 76. It came out in 77. I mean, so you're talking 40 plus years later, and you still see your work everywhere. Oh, absolutely. It's in, you get references to it in books, magazines, um, adverts. It's, it's just everywhere. You, you can't be, yeah. like, you see Vader in so many places. I mean, everyone, we, we talked about this last time I talked to you, but for people who weren't here, um, everyone always says, like, uh, it was influenced by Samurai Mask. Uh, was that a conscious thing, or is that one of those things that's been blown Not up? Not at all. Really? I mean, all I was given was a small sketch about so big from one angle, just a simple line drawing. Um, and it's been said the German wore helmet uh, and samurai, but no, I mean, that they were never mentioned. John Barry, the designer, just said he wanted something, uh, a character that looked evil and menacing and um, probably achieved it, really. I, I think you nailed it. Yeah. Um, but the actual job itself, I did the mask, the helmet, the chest armor, shoulder belts and the shins. Yeah. But I never ever met Dave Frouse, who was in the suit, on the picture. What I did get was a plaster model of him. Oh, so weird. they molded Dave Frouse and reproduced him in plaster so that I knew whatever I sculpted on top of that plaster model I knew would fit him afterwards. Dave Frouse not allowed to yeah. change size at all yeah. for... The funny really? thing was, he couldn't remember ever being moulded for Star Wars. <laughs> but I know the fact, well he was, because I had a plaster model of him. But he, um, he fainted while they were moulding, because oh, they wow. got very hot and they had to call the nurse round to give him smelling salts. But oh, he, he couldn't remember that, was whether by choice or... <laughs> full, full body as well? Full body, yeah. So would he have just been put in a coffin and then a little straw? Oh, pretty much so, yeah. Yeah, I think if, if you pass out now, yeah. that's allowed. That yeah, yeah, yeah it does get very hot. Oh, mate. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you ever been moulded? I haven't. I've got only a, a hand or an arm I put into Algernate, which is nothing. Just nothing, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen plenty of people be moulded, as you say, the straws up the nostrils and whatever, but it's normally the mould makers on the film, the yeah. plasterers that do that. It's just, I find that that's so fascinating. You put so much trust in people to get you out of that. I don't think I trust them. Yeah, funny enough, one of the uh, ladies that was a sculptor in the film, they, she had her hand um, um, moulded and uh, she didn't take a ring off and the guy that moulded her did it in the hard plaster and that goes really hot. She lost her finger what? because of it, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, sometimes it can go wrong. Oh, what? Not very often. So, so the ring just heated up? Ring heated up. She got gangrene in her finger and it had to be taken. Oh, what? Yeah. I think that was on Empire Strikes Back. Oh, which is yeah. foreshadowing in a way, to, for Luke's hands. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a little pro tip for you if you're ever going to get moulded in hard plaster, guys. Take your jewellery off. Um, but I mean, like, like you say, you've, it's not just Star Wars you've worked on. Your work is pretty much every film I've ever loved, I think. You're somewhere involved in, in making something in there. Yeah, I mean, there's ten Bond movies. Um, all three Indiana Jones, both Tomb Raiders, Alien, the list goes on. But the list does go on and it's an incredible list. Um, I think probably talking about some of the, I mean, most people know Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Raiders yeah. of Art, a lost art. Well, on the Raiders, I did the, there were two of us that worked on the Ark itself, the Ark of the Covenant, yeah. um, which is quite a recognised piece. Now, is it the Covenant? which has the Star Wars reference in the film. There is, it's the Egyptian scene where Indiana Jones goes down the Anubis figures into yeah, yeah, the snake pit. Yeah. The uh, and the there's Oscar. Egyptian panels there, and yeah. one of those panels um, has R2-D2 on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything to do with you there, or did that... I can't remember whether I did it or not. <laughs> 
Um, there were two of us doing those panels, so it was a 50% chance <laughs> yeah, so I did it. See, because like, I'm a huge film fan, and I guarantee a, a few of them in here will be too, uh, but that is the sort of thing I love. Do you get to do a lot of that sort of thing, or is it oh, harder well, now? Well, on um, uh, Temple of Doom, in the, um, where they had the sacrifice, there was a lava flow there, and me and another guy, we were doing all this like, script yeah. right the way down the whole thing. And we had crew members coming up to us and saying, well, you put my name on there. <laughs> yeah, all right, so we put it back to front, upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was lots of names in, the, in there that, you know, so occasionally you get that sort of thing. There was another one in the, um, the set where um, they, at the end, where the Ark of the Covenant is open yeah. and all the uh, German soldiers, their faces start yeah. melting and that. Well, when we were carving that, one evening we were working overtime and just for a bit of a fun, because I've done something way back on Alien with these parrots, but I won't go into that, but I'll tell you what we did here. We decided to put little baby rabbit, uh, rabbit families around the rocks. And in half an hour, what we did is we drew one simple rabbit one end of the block and a smaller one the other end, and we cut in unison, and then we sliced them up and put them around the rock set. And uh, next morning, the designer on that film was Norman Reynolds, who was designed on two of the Star Wars pictures. Uh, he came in and he, he noticed them. <laughs> He didn't say a word from, uh, to us, but the look on his face said it all. <laughs> so as soon as he'd left the stage, we took them all down. <laughs> and they didn't reappear. Oh. But th there was a, um, on, um, another one on Raiders that people might recognise was when Harrison Ford is in front of the Cobra. Yeah. And when they shoot from behind his head, there's a glass sheet there and there's a real cobra behind that. Oh really? Yeah, that's a real one. Really? And then when they shoot the other way, into his terrified face, they couldn't use a real snake because you couldn't use a glass sheet, yeah. it would be seen. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I sculpted the cobra that you see there. Oh, wow. Um, and, and carrying on the theme of snakes, there was in the scene in the, Temple of Doom, where they were sitting around the fire, the baby elephants behind. Oh, and yeah. And the main actress, she hated snakes. And she's sitting against a tree, and a 15 foot python comes down and rests its head on her yeah. shoulders. Well, she wouldn't have a snake near her. So I sculpted that 15 oh, wow. foot python that comes down, and she grabs it and throws it. Well, you couldn't do that with a weight and a real python with its tail around yeah. the tree. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was one. What um, did you make that out of? Well, I did it in clay, but then they mould it and they they cast it in like a, um, a foam, foam rose oh, wow. and latex rubber, rubber, yeah. Oh, wow. But uh, and then some lady paint, paint, they, they did about four of them in the end and uh, she um, painted them to look really realistic. Yeah, was it, I, I, I'm trying to think of that scene now. So remember, they definitely had a real one. Now I can't remember seeing a fake one, so good work there. Is there anything like, you know, artists always say, oh, it's hard to draw hands. Is there anything you just, if someone says, can you make something like this, you're just like, no. Um, well, I've never ever turned the job down, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I don't think I can do it, you always do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, figures are always, people are critical of figure work because <clears throat> it's something you see all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah either your own body or someone else's body, but I mean, bodies vary, so as long as you've got the anatomy, you know, reasonably yeah. right, you, you can do them. But uh, that was uh, one of the Bond films. Uh, I did, I, the two of us did all the big Russian statues in the uh, Russian statue park on Goldeneye. Oh, wow. It was a night nice scene. Uh, there was a 20-foot Stalin that uh, yeah, yeah. we carved, a 17-foot figure of Lenin and lots of lots of other work and uh, the, the scene was Bond was in, in the park and all of a sudden you see four little red lights on his yeah, chest yeah, yeah. that they had that their guns uh, you know aimed at him and uh, so it was just that that night scene and, and that was it 
Oh wow. What's what's your um, like again? You must get this all the time. But what are the the things that not necessarily your proudest of, but the thing that you're proudest of that might not be seen in the forefront? Like obviously Darth Vader's helmet is there. Yeah. You see, is there anything that's sort of hidden and you just go, I'm so proud of that. So there's so much actually. I mean. Things like Clash of the Titans, all that Syrian work, yeah, the big yeah. fi figures and the Syrian balls and the panels at the yeah. archway, that was nice to do. And a film that was similar to that, same style of work, was Alexander the Great. Oh, I, I did Wing Kings uh, with, with four wings, 14 foot high. Oh, wow. and, um, and that's a lovely style. I've done lots of films with Egyptian work on as well, which is very different. Yeah, yeah. Um, from the fact that Assyrian work, they're very clever. It looks as though it's standing up from the background, but what they actually do is they round the background in so it looks as though they're standing out. Oh, wow. Well, with, with Egyptian um, uh, work and panels, you get the ground come across and you get a V cut around the actual outside of the figure, and the figure rounds down into it, so it's, it looks like it's behind oh, the wow. main panel. So they're very different ways, technical ways of yeah. doing, doing the work. Are they both just sort of perspective tricks, or are they, are they just... They are, literally, it is pers perspective tricks. And it's very clever, because it was a fraction of the work to do at the yeah, time, yeah. when they were carving everything in granite and marble and the like. You know, it, it makes it so much quicker and easier to do. So do you, did you research that before you... For Clash of the Titans, yeah. yeah went up to uh, the British Museum and actually then seeing the way they had done it, it made it so much easier for oh, us. Really? Otherwise I would have just been doing a figure that stood out <laughs> yeah. from a background. Just guessing what it would have yeah, been. Yeah. It's, it's incredible because that's the weird thing with like, the sort of work you do. Obviously something like the Darth Vader mask, it's iconic, everyone knows it and obviously you're going to be proud of that. But a lot of the stuff that you do, I guess the trick is to make it not noticeable in a way, like it's going to just sit perfectly there. Oh, I mean, on like some of the Bond, Bond movies, all movies, you get a, they might go and do the exterior shots out in India or the palace or something. Yeah. Then all the interiors are done back at Pinewood or, or whatever yeah, studio yeah. is. So all those interior sets, after all the ornate work has to be sculpted. Um, so that's all, you have to do every sort of style that they want uh, yeah. and reproduce it. There was one, uh, I think it was Octopussy, where Bond comes sliding down this uh, circular staircase and he sees an ornate pineapple on the bottom of the um, stairway on, on the, uh, where he's going to be sliding off. He realises he's going to do himself some damage. He has a gun with him and he starts shooting it off, so he just slides off the end and walks off as Bond would. <laughs> as you do, <laughs> as you do. What was it, because again, I'm obsessed with this, because your, your work in my mind would take forever. I'm sure it doesn't for yourself. Is there anything where the turnaround was just so tight you didn't think you'd get it done, or is that every job? Many, many times. Especially when, as soon as they start filming, yeah. that's when everything becomes urgent. Yeah. And, you know, before that, the designers can be really fussy and as they can change that bit there, change that bit. There's no changing once the film starts, the camera starts rolling. There's no way you ever hold that camera up so everything is then wanted very quickly. And you do the over, I mean, on um, Star Wars, I did 76 days without a day off. What? Yeah, exactly what. I was, I was like a zombie at the end of it. <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed to, yeah. though. Then generally uh, it would force you into a break. That's crazy. Was that just because everything was... Obviously, you had to make everything look like it was from another world, so there's always something... Well, there's that much, and then because they were the characters, they, they were seen close. Yeah. And, you know, they had to be right from George Lucas's point of view. I mean, he was the one that had last say. John Barry, the designer, would come up on a daily basis, but it was Lucas that come up and said, yeah, I like that, or yeah. not. I was lucky, he, he liked everything I did, so, yeah. I Doing mean, a good job there. There was no concept, I mean, so many people think that there were concept Vaders done, and every, there wasn't. I had one go at the Vader, one go at the Stormtrooper, and the other characters. That's incredible, again, like, that's so crazy, because now, 
I guess when you make that film, you don't know the legacy that's going to follow it. So now everyone uses your designs, your moulds, and your models to, to replicate that. Um, I think I'm in for the toys and all that sort of thing. They're re, re, re sculpted. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Lucas would let them anywhere near anything that's too. Oh yeah. I mean, EFX got hold of one, um, and they were allowed to use one because they have, they paid Lucas for a license. Ah. So they've got one that, uh, the legend that's quite um, quite near to the original. In fact, when they put up that that for sale, within about three or four minutes, they'd gone way over what they were supposed to sell. They had a, a 250 limited edition. Oh really? And within a couple of minutes, they'd sold nearly 400. So crazy, isn't it? There's a, there's a really, did you ever watch, there's a Netflix documentary uh, about toys and one of them is Star Wars and the toys on it. Did you watch it or? No, I, I didn't. But it's because I... it's they talk about that where they didn't realise how quick the toys were going to take off. Yeah. And they, they exactly that. Yeah. Well, George Lucas, that's a foresight he had. He, I mean, 20th century Fox, saw no value in the toy market whatsoever and George Lucas did and he had the rights to the toys yeah. he got that sewn up and he, he made far far more money on the toys than they did on the film so that allowed him to produce the rest of the films on Star Wars it's crazy as well because now that is every film wants that level of success but there's that there's that beautiful idea with films I think this is why a lot of us find things like Star Wars when we're children and then we grow with it. There's that beautiful idea that the film shouldn't end when the credits roll. And I think that's one of the reasons I think the, the legacy continues so big. Because kids took it and they made their own stories and all because they had these things that when you think about as a child, they look so real and you see them there and go, oh yeah, it's tough, <laughs> but it's, it's beautiful. And like that for me would be something I'd be immensely proud of, mm -hmm. just knowing that. Yeah. Actually, I was just thinking of a little job, I, another little job I did on the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where they plucked the harm out the sacrifice. Oh, uh, yeah, and the, the, you see the heart pumping in the uh, yeah, yeah. guy's hand. So, well, I had to sculpt that, but they decided that I, I should go to Harefield Heart Hospital to see a surgeon there. What? Yeah. <laughs> So I went you in. You didn't hold them hard, did you? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm sitting there chatting with him, and uh, I said, "What's the closest heart I can get to a human?" And he said, "The primates, which I couldn't get." So I ended up um, a sheep's heart was pretty close yeah. to a human heart. So I used that for all the detail, and then I had a plastic hospital uh, model. So I got the veins in the right place, and I had sort of veins up to six inches coming off, as though they'd been torn when he ripped it out yeah. and as I was leaving he turned to me and said oh I'm doing open heart surgery tomorrow would you like to come and watch <laughs> I didn't have to take the thing for long I just said thanks but no thanks thanks it's, it's okay. finished I'll give it a mess yeah I could hardly stop him halfway through the operation <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. can you rest his uh, heart <laughs> on his chest I'm gonna could you just I'm tear it out so I can okay. see I want to take a few photographs so yeah <laughs> But the sort of fun jobs you get to do. It's, it, I mean, that's the thing, is because you've got to make everything look like it belongs in a film. So imagine, yeah, there's, there's no other way sometimes than just going to odd places. It like. has to look realistic. You have to believe that what you're looking at on the screen is right, even if it is a palace and the interiors have all been built. Because you see the ex exterior, your mind immediately says that that's the interior of the yeah. palace. Yeah. And it's all so ornate and, and uh, so much work involved in it that people just take it that that's what it is. Did you always have a natural flair for this or was it just something you, you sort of wandered into? Well, I, I started in the film industry at the age of 16. But did you go in to do that sort of thing or? Was that just something you found? I was just lucky being in the right place at the right time. Always the case. They turned down 12 people before me and he took a liking to me and liked what I'd done. And, uh, oh, who was your mentor? It was a guy called Arthur Healy, but he died in about 1980s sometime. He was working on the film at the time oh, when he passed away. 
Did you have any other mentors, or was it a case of just learn on the job after that? Um, well, as I said, I went straight from school, so all I had done paintings and drawings, and I, I had um, carved this little totem pole with an inch chisel that was pretty crappy, really. But <laughs> but I don't know if that made any difference. But he, as I say, he, he decided to give me a go and uh, put a lot of effort into what I was doing. I did go to college to do life drawing, life sculpt, sculpting um, from models. Oh, wow. Uh, also did wood carving. So when I had finished in the film industry and went outside for a few years, I did um, wood carving for the House of Commons and churches and all that sort of thing. It's crazy. Um, um, it's, it's one of those things, I think, because like a lot of people love film and you see these sorts of things and people never know how to get into it but I'm such a big believer in someone does that job so if you have a drive to do it you'll find a way into it and it, but then you hear stories like this and it's like ah, I just fell into it that's the reason I say I was so lucky yeah. I was around at the right time when they actually wanted someone yeah. it's very difficult to get into the job even now it's a bit easier now because a lot of the big blockbuster films have a lot of sculptors. In fact, the film that I had the most sculptors on wasn't that long ago. It was um, Beauty and the Beast. Really? All that really lovely um, Gothic architecture. Yeah, no, it was um, Rococo the style that they had in the. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, it's uh, showing my ignorance there. <laughs> well, you've got the rock, and Rococo yeah. takes that style a bit yeah. further. Um, Whereas the Baroque is balanced in it itself, but slightly out balanced. The Rococo is all over the place, but looks balanced, though it isn't. Oh, wow. Um, so all that really ornate work on that film, I did a, a good part of that, especially the ballroom, where it's all really nicely done. That's, do you know what else? Is, I mean, yeah, it's beautiful. Do you know what's lovely about that as well is, I think a lot of us think now that so much of it is CGI, and you don't know whether the balance is practical. Because obviously now, You've got the internet, you see all these pictures from sets where you've got sort of a bit of architecture jitter up into a green screen. Yeah. And then you never know where the sort of line is. Whereas obviously in the older days, like, I don't know if you did on Flash, you still have the big painting boards where you have like the, the distance perspectives and stuff like that. So it's, it's lovely to see that crack is still very Oh, it's there, it is alive and has been right the way through to varying degrees. Um, I think. CGI is a fantastic thing when used at the right time. Yeah. When someone comes onto a picture and he says, that's it, I'm going to do it all CGI, it doesn't work. And people can see the difference. And I think it makes the performance of the uh, actors a little more, bit more Absolutely. Because all they're acting to is, is a screen. They don't even have the props in their hands. Yeah, yeah. They have to pretend they've got a prop. So it makes their, their acting a little wooden, I think. Um, that they, they prefer to have a set, they prefer to have props yeah. and so on. And Star Wars went back to that because George in, I think it was number one, The Phantom Menace, the, the main spaceship, the only part of that that wasn't CGI was the leg what? of the spaceship. And the only reason, which I sculpted, and the only reason that that was done is because the actors run down the ramp and the, the leg has to be there. That is mind-blowing. But, but yeah, I mean things like Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one, the Necrograph, which is re really organic. Yeah, yeah. We did the end section of that, there was a team that's on that because it was quite a big job to do. We had to do it because the actors come running out the back. I did the cockpit at the front, plus the very front of the, the uh, craft, and all the rest of it was CGI. That is crazy. But again, but it works. It's the lines you can't yeah. see. Like, no. I, I, if you told me, if you gave me that shot and said, guess what's real and what's not, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Like, no. I'd assume the cockpit was real, because, yeah. But still, it's, it, that is crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I, like again, that's the other thing. Like a lot of the time when you do things, I imagine people focus on like Indiana and, and Star Wars and stuff. But I forget you've done so much in the MCU. Like, well, things like uh, Alien, the, uh, it, space, oh, the space, space jockey, jockey, yeah, 
Yeah. Genuinely, my favourite set of any film is in the, the, the yeah. all the that back work. and the back set was all done as well. I did all those bones that come round go right round the set. I did one section of that. They moulded it, and there were just hundreds of cars. And they just recast it. Yeah, and one side marries into the other side, so I had a template one side and a template the other side. So I knew that one side would match into the oh, other. Wow. So it looks as though it's solid bones going right the way up. How much of that w w was Geiger's sort of vision, and how much did you just sort of put into that? Um, well, Geiger was so clever with his um, artwork. He, he, it was all done with air airbrush, and it was very three-dimensional. Really? He loved coming on to the set each day and seeing, looking at the progress on that. Um, but he was a very clever artist. Oh yeah. Um, no kids. <laughs> I mean, we were up doing the entrances to the spaceship and Giebel walked onto the stage we were working on. There were two of us, a guy that called Peter Boise and myself, and it was us two that did the space jockey. But he brought in the reference for the spaceship entrances and they were top shelf magazines, very explicit. Yeah. And when Giga left the stage, we looked at each other, we both burst out laughing and <laughs> said, we can't do that. <laughs> so what you actually see is a stylized version. <laughs> I never knew that, and now yeah. I'm going to be looking for anything. <laughs> oh yeah. Because again, yeah. Alien, obviously there's a lot of that metaphor in there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just check the time, right? Because otherwise, I'm going to keep you on here forever. Uh, yeah. I've been talking to you for far too long because I want to give people a chance to ask you questions. So, uh, otherwise, I will just talk to you forever. So, if anyone's got a question for Brian about anything, just get your hand up. I'm gonna. Yeah, can find... you go out with him? Otherwise yeah, I will. Is Thomas down there? Is we got right. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go round. Uh, I'll be about two seconds, but I'll keep talking on the way. We're supposed to have someone with a microphone, but I'm coming. Uh, just you relax up there, Brian. Oh, yeah. Um, we had a question down here. Uh, come in, come in, come in. Ah, hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, because you talked about this before, but uh, how much uh, artistic freedom do you get when you're trying to design something? Do, uh, for example, with Darth Vader, but also with other things, do they just tell you what kind of style, or do they regularly check up on what you've made and give you pointers on how to change it, or how does yeah. that work? It, it varies with every film. Sometimes you're given a little tiny um, scribble, other times, uh, you're, you're, they'll give you a picture from a book of a, like a panel, Syrian panel, and they say, I want that 14 foot high. So then I have to draw it from the, the one that's that big to 14 foot high. So it varies from it every, every film. Um, but if it's, the film is a certain style, then that's the style you've got to do for that film and the period. So, you know, you have to be able to do it authentically, otherwise you're, you're no good to, you know, the um, designer or the film. Okay, any more questions whilst I'm down here? Oh, yes sir. Always oh, a Jedi, isn't it? Oh no, it's, not, it's a knight. So chainmail, that's the difference. Just a question about, uh, again, Dark Vader. Um, when you said earlier you were given a small sketch to start off, did you know anything about the sound design of the game at that point? Because I know they've changed from the day to the but did you know he was going to have the labor of the you know, that kind of thing? No, that was all done by the special effects. So I did the visual Vader in, in clay on top of the blaster model, but when I finished, there's a whole chain of people after me um, before from Lucas. Um, my wife's done a website, the original Darth Vader, and it, it puts all the people um, that were involved, from George Lucas down to the guys that moulded the um, or, or, or the um, Darth Vader helmet and everything else, um, down to the guy that painted it. And then you have um, John Steers, it uh, uh, ran the special effects department. They did the box and the breathing and all that side of it. So it's a whole team of people. Um, although I cre created the look of Vader, there's a lot of other people involved. 
tell you anything about that they had that plan? That was all. No, 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 no. From my point of view, it's just purely getting the visual side of Vader um, sorted. Oh wow! Uh, question from Matthew. I was just up there a second ago. Uh, how's that feel though when you do see it alive? Is it, do you, do you have it? Do you ever imagine what it's going to be like, and then you're like, oh wow? You don't. You don't really know exactly what it's going to look like. Um, but I was extremely impressed when you see Vader the, for the first time coming through that mist. It's like a wow. Yeah. It's, I mean, for everyone who's ever seen it, we're like. Oh, uh, this guy! Yeah. Incredible. Uh, any more questions while I'm on the floor? Any more? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm coming. Oh. Uh, first of all, apologies. I'm more of a Star Trek fan than Star Wars fan. But if they were to invite you to work on a Star Trek project, uh, would you be interested? And what kind of ship or station, what, is there anything that you would have liked to have, would have worked on or something you would like to work on if they asked you to? Um, well I've actually retired now so I won't be working on any more films um, uh, and 48 years and being under pressure to turn out work on a daily basis was probably enough for me. Um, but. I've been asked that question before, would I, are there any films that I would like to have worked on? And the answer is no really, because I'm happy, with, I've worked on so many major movies that I'm happy with the way my career went uh, uh, and uh, has gone. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm happy with the work I've done over the years. Amazing. That's, that's the best answer you can ever give. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy in my work. It's, it's beautiful. Any more questions before I run back on stage? Okay. Don't make me run back because I'm not as healthy as I used to be. Uh, I'm coming, Brian. You just stay there. We're going to show some work in a second from the video. Um, do we have that? Oh, we've got a video of your work set up. So for anyone who uh, is a fan of films and a fan of Brian's work, might not know some of this, we're just going to roll on the TV uh, a little, little video of some of Brian's work. And you can just, we're sitting in the presence of a legend, so just enjoy the clips. We'll just, you've seen Yeah, it, it's, it's only a, a small selection of the work that I've done, but it's, it gives you an idea of the type of work. Is that going to be out the back it's, here? It's good, we, we will maybe be able to, no, we're going to just, you might be able to see it from here if you need to talk through it. But no, yeah. no, it's okay. We'll carry on talking, but they can have a look at the, uh, yeah, the we'll, film. Yeah, we'll talk while that rolls. Um, I didn't realise you retired because I knew you were working still on the MCU films. When did you retire? It's about my last picture was Rogue One. Really? I called it a day. I, I felt in a way I'd gone full circle. I did work on The Force Awakens and then the Rogue One and Guardians, Captain America. Um, the Rogue One's your retirement film. Yeah, yeah, that was that, That's that. a beautiful symmetry as well, especially yeah. like because of that, yeah, exactly that yeah. Uh, that's so uh, good. Do you know how many films you've worked on? Do you have a, it's around about 70. Uh, and a lot of them are, are very, you know, blockbusters, really. Yeah, I mean, it, like I say, you've worked on, when people say iconic films, you've pretty much had most of them. It's, it's so incredible, especially as you're like, yeah, I just, just got lucky. Well, I did get lucky. I mean, there's no doubt about that, just being where I was at the right time. Um, but it's when, what you do with that yeah. luck. I mean, if, if you think you've made it when you arrive, you haven't. It takes yeah, years and years and years. And probably at the end of 48 years, you can probably turn around and say, I made it. But uh, not before, because you're, you're learning all the time. Every job you do, every, you find new ways around it. Uh, and you, you're always thinking, you know, can I better that? Can I do it a better way, quicker or whatever? That, but that, that's the beautiful thing about it. People who, especially in the film industry, people who make it that sort of that long, are the people who always want to better themselves. I think if you get to a point where you go, 
Yeah, I've got my skills now. I'm good. You'll just it's yeah. time to pack up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. It's, it's, so. it's incredible. Uh, we are going to wrap up. I'm, I'm going to ask you the thing that I'm sure you get asked all the time, but because I'm I, I love memorabilia, as many people do here. Is there anything in your house? Is it like a museum, or have you kept it clean? No, it's, it's clean. I mean, we've moved to an old barn conversion, and we've got a lovely office there, and I've got a few Vaders up, and Stormtrooper helmets, and a few other bits. Um, there are a couple of pictures that Giga sent to me, uh, straight after an alien of the space jockey. Oh, wow. They sat in the envelope he sent them in for 40 years. What? 40 years, well, and just recently we got them framed and they look lovely up in the office. I'm going to say as well, I bet they're all yeah. like, Original kick, as you said in an that's, that, that's mind blowing to me. But then, I mean, when the kids, our kids were younger, they have sort of got to be like grandkids now, but um, there was a Bond movie and um, there was some skaters with masks on. Yeah, yeah. They were chasing Bond. They were going round and round the ice, circling him. And I got a couple of them done for the kids. And they played with them for a bit. And, and then they weren't, so I just took them up and dumped them and threw them in the skip. What? Yes, exactly. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're the second yeah. person who's told me something like that, and I'm like, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, I did that with a, a, a bit of a fun job on Octopussy. I had lots of lovely work on to do on that old India. But there was a scene on uh, the train where Bond is on there and there's a bomb sitting there. And then the baddies come through and uh, Roger Moore goes behind this gorilla suit and he's looking through the eyes. Well, I had to do that gorillas, uh, the gorilla. And it was a bit of a joke thing, it was. It wasn't supposed to be too realistic. Yeah. And uh, I got one of them done for the kids. The same oh, thing. Oh, wow. Down the dump. <laughs> what? This. Yeah. I'm not going to say it hurts me because I, I understand that if you were like me, you would need three barns because of all the stuff you would need. I'd like to imagine as well your barn that you're converting has just got like an ornate Egyptian end. That just <laughs> no, no, nothing. Clean like lines. Yeah. Well, as clean as you get in the barn version. True. The walls are all round and nothing is square in there. <laughs> yeah. That's the best. Yeah. Answer. Yeah. Nothing, nothing straight. It's great. Yeah. Uh, Brian, we're going to have to turn around the stage for our next guest, but like I say, I, I, I can happily do this until midnight, but I'm going to let you go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, give him all your love, it's Brian Muir. Yeah, he'll be here all weekend, so please go to see him, please talk to him. Uh, yeah, and just, if you see him around, hey Brian. Uh, we will see you in a second, we're going to just turn the stage around, we'll be back in a, a second.